Welcome everyone to today's ZOA Donor Society event, the ripple success of Governor Ron DeSantis' trade and education mission to Israel. For those of you on the Zoom I have not yet met, my name is Sharona Whistler. I serve as the Executive Director of the Zionist Organization of America's Florida region. I wanna start by recognizing and thanking my colleagues who have helped behind the scenes with this event. Thank you, Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Engagement, Enid Roman, our administrative assistant and Jackie Schaefer, communications manager. Thank you to the ZOA Florida board. And thank you to the, gov the governor's staff who I've had the pleasure of working with a couple times now, especially through Minor, Mara Gavineri and Casey Smith, Chloe Judge. I'd like to recognize and welcome our friends from the Israeli consulate in Miami, including <laughs> General Rebi Talmalka. And most of all, to you, our, our ZOA Donor Society members. It is amazing to have such a great turnout today, certainly to the credit, credit of our wonderful Florida governor. ZOA's crucial work in Israel activism and combating against anti-Semitism, be it on college campuses, on Capitol Hill with our government relations department and in the courts with our Center for Law and Justice is tremendously continuously relied upon, especially now. ZOA Florida was proud to have led the way in organizing a big and successful South Florida Stands with Israel rally last week. And everything we do is only possible because of our donors, but especially our exceptionally generous donors like you. On a more personal note, I'm proud to represent ZOA because I know we'll always be unapologetic and uncompromising in our Zionism on behalf of, and on behalf of the Jewish people speaking the truth. So I just wanna say that ZOA voice, all of your voices, involvement, and financial support on behalf of ZOA is very much appreciated. Thank you truly. As a proud Jewish Zionist and a proud Floridian, it is so exciting to be doing this program with ZOA Florida's 2019 Zionist Hero Honoree and recipient of ZOA National's Shillman Award for Outstanding Leadership, the Honorable Honorable Ron DeSantis, Governor for the State of Florida, my governor, and ZOA National President Morton Klein, on the two-year anniversary of Governor DeSantis's trade and education mission to Israel. This was an incredible initiative and mission that Governor DeSantis invited Morton Klein to participate in as the representative, representative of a Zionist organization, a very proud moment for us. I will introduce ZOA National President Morton Klein and then give it over to him to introduce the governor. The last few weeks for Israel and the Jewish people have been terrifying with many anti-Semitic incidents around the world, including several here in Florida. And ZOA National President Morton Klein has been tireless. He has, he has been and is always at the forefront when it comes to speaking the truth about Israel and the truth about our friend, who our friends are and who our enemies are. We truly have an incredible and fearless leader at the helm of ZOA. Morton Klein is widely regarded as one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States. He's a child of Holocaust survivors, born in a displaced persons camp in Gunsberg, Germany. The National Jewish Weekly, The Forward, named Morton Klein one of the top five Jewish leaders in the US today, stating it's impossible to deny that Klein has been extraordinary, extraordinarily effective. Mr. Klein awarded with a certificate of appreciation and recognition outstanding contributions to national and international affairs by the U.S. Department of State. He has served as a biostatistician at UCLA School of Public Health and the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine, having worked closely with two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. Please know that this is only a fraction of Mort's achievements, and more with that, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Sharona Whistler, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, and uh, I want to put on the hat <clears throat> that was given to us for those of us who, had, who joined with uh, the governor in our in his uh, first trade mission to any foreign country he made it Israel and I was proud and honored to be part of that it's my special and extraordinary honor to introduce America's greatest governor 
Yes, Governor Ron Dion DeSantis. And that's another reason I love Governor Ron Dion DeSantis. His middle name is in the name of my favorite doo-wop singer, Dion of Dion and the Belmonts, who sang such classics as Donna the Prima Donna and Run Around Sue, and the classic Abraham, Martin, and John. Uh, the governor went to Yale and Harvard Law School, but more importantly, he was captain of the Yale baseball team with the highest batting average in the team, 336. He was a lawyer in the Navy, won the Bronze Star, the uh, uh, Global War and Terrorism Service Medal, the Iraq Campaign Medal. He was in Congress for, uh, from 2013 to 2018, uh, a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and chair of the Subcommittee on the Middle East. Uh, he intentionally had hearings to move the embassy when he saw that that issue was not being talked about. He had hearings when moving the embassy to Jerusalem. I was honored to be one of the people testifying. And shortly after that hearing, uh, President Trump announced he's moving the embassy to Jerusalem. He had hearings on sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Again, I was honored to be testifying in that hearing because uh, the Golan Heights was not being talked about. Shortly after uh, Governor DeSantis hearing the Golan Heights, uh, President Trump announced uh, that the Golan Heights uh, should remain sovereign uh, Israeli uh, territory. So both things happened. <laughs> uh, the governor opposed the Iran deal. He opposes US taxpayer money going to the terrorist regime of the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Um, and he worked on the issue to make sure that anything made in Judea and Samaria should say made in Israel, not made in the occupied territories. As governor of Florida, Governor DeSantis insightfully understood the reality of the Chinese virus and refused to have any extensive lockdowns. Unlike most other states, schools remained open, businesses and restaurants flourished, and Floridians were free to enjoy their lives with no untoward consequences. Governor DeSantis' policies should have been a model for the rest of the country. And that's why people are moving to Florida in droves even before they retire. And the evidence shows that even Democrats who are moving to Florida are registering as Republicans, being inspired by the great Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida. I'm privileged to introduce to you one of America's greatest statesmen and leaders, my friend, Governor Ron Dion DeSantis. Governor? Well, thanks so much, Mort. What a great introduction. And let me just thank you for um being in the fight for so many years, long before I came on the scene, but I can tell you anytime we were having any of these skirmishes in the Congress, uh, you were not only there, but, but you were fearless. And I think what we see, particularly in the last many years, is uh, when people are standing up for principle, standing up for the right things, uh, you face a lot of blowback, particularly by a very corrupt and partisan corporate media. Uh, I think that they tend to smear people that are their political opponents. And so you got to display courage in the face of that. And I can tell you, you know, Mort has never wilted uh, once. I mean, he's, he's there time and time and time again. Uh, he fights back um, and he stands uh, for the truth. And that's really something that is um, unfortunately too rare uh, in, in, in our modern uh, political uh, uh, system. I, I, when we did the trade mission to Israel, uh, we um, were doing it for a number of reasons. Um, one, we saw economic opportunity. You know, these Israeli companies, there's so much innovation that takes place there. Uh, when they start to look to the United States, you know, where do they look to? And we wanted to make sure Florida uh, was on the map for that. Uh, and we've actually seen progress. In fact, uh, one of the companies that we met with uh, that treats uh, algae and, and water, uh, yeah, I met with them. I didn't know, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, because you can compete to, to try to get contracts. It's not like it's anything I give out. So I was impressed with what it was, but you know, whatever, they met with the right people and they, they, they knew if they wanted to compete in Florida, how to do it kind of deal. Well, then like at the end of last summer, you know, we started to see possibilities. We had a lot of rain that the Army Corps of Engineers was going to send some of this water out of our big lake, Lake Okeechobee, and had algae in it. And I'm like, what do we, we, we should do something. And so sure enough, they're like, yeah, we got the company from Israel's out in the water <laughs> treating, treating the algae. And so, and then there's, we have university partnerships. We have a lot of great stuff uh, going on. We also were able to, to take people and just see uh, some of the history, because I think uh, until you do that, uh, you just don't fully uh, appreciate, uh, but to take people and they can open up a Bible and walk into these areas where, where these, uh, where these uh, folks uh, were 
Um, there was, um, I've told the story in front of Mort before, but uh, the first time my wife and I went to Israel, we didn't have any kids. So I was in Congress. We now have three. We have a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old. We didn't have any then, but we knew eventually, you know, obviously we were going to do that. So my wife got water from the Sea of Galilee, and she just put it in, in the plastic water bottles. Fortunately, Israeli security is not like uh, TSA. It's no theater, only substance. So like they knew it was water, and they just let her take it on the plane. It wasn't a problem. Um, we'd have to take off our shoes and do all this, uh, the theater they do in the United States. They actually were doing it right. Um, so we brought it home. My oldest daughter was born at the end of 16. So we did her baptism. We used the water from the Sea of Galilee to baptize her. But we had more because, you know, we weren't going to necessarily stop at one. So when my son was born in 2018. I was running for governor. I was also in, in the Congress. So it was very hectic. He was born at the end of March. So we were thinking about this baptism. And I'm like, you know what? We should just, my wife and I, let's just wait till we get through this election because it's so hectic. So we got through the election, like, all right, what are we going to do? And you're like, you know, we're getting inaugurated on January 8th. I'm going to have all the friends and family in town in Tallahassee anyways. Why don't we just do it then? So I gave my inauguration speech. I canceled the inaugural parade. I'm like, you know what? We'll just go back to the mansion, um, governor's mansion, and we'll baptize uh, our son Mason. So we had the water from the Sea of Galilee, and we used it. Everything was fine. The problem is, you know, we weren't used to people picking up after us, and so the water, the, the water, it was just in like a normal water bottle. Um, now it was, the label was written in Hebrew. So it was a little bit different than like the Zephyr Hills you'd get at a gas station. But nevertheless, it wasn't anything, I guess, that the, that the staff probably thought was, was conspicuous. So we go to the inaugural ball, we do all this. Next morning, I wake up and I'm thinking, I thought of this water. I said to my wife, um, did we get that water? She's like, uh, I think it's just downstairs. And I look down there. It was gone. So they had disposed of it, whatever. So then I'm in a, I'm at a synagogue in Boca Raton a week or two later. And I announced that story. I was like, you know, now my wife doesn't have a bun in the oven or anything, but you know, we are out of water from the Sea of Galilee. Within like 24 hours, people start sending us pictures. You have Israelis uh, in the Sea of Galilee getting water out. And then like a week later, I get a big jar of it sent uh, to my house in Tallahassee. It's still sitting there now uh, with water from the Sea of Galilee. And so we do have, um, we did end up having another child, Mamie, uh, last uh, last March. Um, but, you know, it was, an, it was a funny story, but it, because of the, you know, they threw it away, all this other stuff. But once I announced it, the word traveled halfway around the world. You had all these folks uh, going there and then sending this back. So it shows the, the connection, uh, you know, that we have. And then obviously the people that go for the first time, and I know more has probably seen this, uh, you know, it's it just the history, how our culture was really derived, um, you know, for you go to go to Jerusalem, go to the Holy Land, and then look at things like, um, like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And it's like, that's kind of uh, how we became where we are in terms of our foundations, although those foundations are being challenged, it seems every day uh, from the radical left. But people really get... Um, they, they are changed by doing it. And it's a, it's a major experience in people's lives. And so I've been able to go multiple times. I mean, you know, we've got an initial trip in Congress, as Mort said, I just didn't, the, this embassy mission, I went over there, we looked at all the sites, people said Trump wasn't going to move it. And uh, I, we looked at all the sites, the one we identified is the one that David Friedman ultimately picked with the State Department. I did a big press conference at the King David Hotel. And I said, listen, if Trump said he's going to move it in the campaign, he's going to move it. Now, we're disappointed he didn't do it immediately, but, but he will do it. And um, so we did that. And then we did the hearing to get more momentum. It was a massive hearing. I mean, an unbelievable crowd came for that. And, uh, and then it was done. And then we were all there when they actually consecrated it, uh, however many months later, which was uh, really special. And Every expert was saying, if you move the embassy, it's going to be a disaster. You're going to have all these problems. And yet you didn't see any problems. I mean, the embassy went in 18. The decision was at the end of 17. Then it was moved in 18. And we really had the region probably had never done better because Trump got out of the Iran deal. Um, and I think he basically by moving what I what I told them was, you know, the embassy should be moved because it's the right thing to do. First and foremost, Jerusalem is the capital, eternal, and undivided capital of the Jewish people. But I also said geopolitically, 
you have every world leader calling you, telling you not to do it. Obviously, the Arabs don't want to see you do it, right? If you do it and just show strength in that, that's going to send a very strong message, particularly throughout the Middle East. And those folks, particularly the Arabs, they respect a strong horse. And when they see somebody that's acting with strength, even if it's against their, their uh, preferences, uh, they respect that more than if you indulge their preferences but are showing weakness in the process. And so I think having the Abraham Accords fl uh, 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 flow directly from the decisions to get out of the Iran deal and to move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and we really were seeing tremendous success. Unfortunately, now, uh, because there's a new sheriff in town, and I think you have a, a president who, quite frankly, is more of an absentee president. Let's just be honest. I mean, it's not even a partisan criticism. That's just the reality. He's got a lot of people that are pushing the buttons, um, a lot of folks that are very obviously left wing and ideological. Um, and so I don't think he's projecting the type of strength that is going to be respected uh, throughout that region. So I think what you're seeing with, um, uh, with Hamas is Iran is emboldened now because of Biden. Uh, and obviously, they're going to have the ability to fund, and especially if Biden uh, sends them more money, going to be able to fund even more terrorism. And I also think that Hamas, look, I think the PA is a terrorist group too. I mean, I think they both indulge in terrorism. Uh, but I th think that the PA, they are more respected outside, uh, in, amongst other countries. Um, whereas Hamas, I think most people have to admit that they're a terrorist organization. Um, Democrat administrations in, in, in the US as well as Europe, they indulge the PA. I mean, we've sent some of the money that's been sent over with UNRWA and all this stuff for Palestinian Arabs. It's been a total waste of money. It's really just contributed to additional uh, bad behavior. But nevertheless, what Hamas, I think, sees the opportunity is to supplant the PA as the leading power uh, in Judea and Samaria. And uh, if they're able to do that, um, obviously, you would have a more overt terrorist state uh, that is able to project more power uh, throughout Israel. Uh, so that obviously is not a, not a good thing. But I think it is um, because of the weakness that we see. Um, I think people think the bad guys think they can just get away with more and more. You know, Israel, uh, we, we obviously, uh, you know, me, they, they should defend themselves to the hill. You can't worry what the media is going to say if you're defending. You just defend yourself because the media in the world, but particularly in the United States, is very corrupt. They're very partisan and they don't uh, focus on facts. They just report narratives. And so their narrative is that Israel's bad and the Ar Palestinian Arabs you know, are good and that they're being victimized by Israeli rule, even though the Arabs who live in Israel are more prosperous than Arabs that live in these other areas. They have more rights, they have more uh, freedoms uh, than they do. You know, if you live on like in Saudi Arabia, unless you're part of the ruling family, you know, you're not, you don't have rights. So it's all a false narrative, but I think that's a narrative that gets put out there. So the key is, is to reject those narratives, but do not allow good policy uh, to be swayed by those narratives. You know, that's kind of what we did, you know, in Florida with, with fighting the lockdowns. Um, you know, initially, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, I looked at, there wasn't a lot of information. You know, we were, a lot of us were looking to people like Fauci for guidance. But, you know, as we got into the end of March, beginning of April, it was pretty clear, uh, you can't lock kids out of school. You can't have people not working, particularly people that are young and healthy. Um, and so we charted that course that was against the narratives of corporate media. It was against the narratives of our bureaucratic class. It was against a lot of narratives. And actually, I mean, I even have people this day that will say, oh man, when you were doing that, everyone was saying it, it wasn't going to, it was bad. It wasn't going to work. I was worried. Now I see clearly, you know, you know, you had the right plan, but if I had to listen to the chattering class, if I had listened to uh, DC, New York media, you know, I wouldn't have done half the things uh, that we were able to do. And that would have been to the detriment of millions of families uh, throughout the throughout the state of Florida. So that's just a lesson. Uh, when you're standing for the right things, unfortunately, in this day and age, you're not going to be celebrated by big media, by big tech, increasingly by big business. 
which, um, you know, as they go woke, understand they are going to be tempted to indulge in anti-Israel activism as well, because these, these left-wing activists pressure these companies uh, to take some of these positions. And you can bet your bottom dollar you can do. I'm proud to say in Florida, and, and, and Mort was um, a part of this, um, you know, we've always fought against um, woke corporations. When, when I became governor, Airbnb uh, had announced they were going to discriminate um, against Jewish uh, homeowners um, in Judea and Samaria, and they wouldn't do the listings. And so we said, uh, that ain't going to fly in Florida. We don't believe in, in BDS. We don't believe in, in targeting uh, Jews in this, in this regard. That's contrary to our law. So we immediately moved to put Airbnb on our dink list that we have for the companies uh, that are violating um, Florida law in this regard. And it didn't take very long uh, for them to come to their senses. And so I think what we have when you have these, these woke corporations, they indulge in this stuff because some of them do believe it for sure. But some of them, I think, just think it's the path of least resistance, just bow down to the most um, loud voices and that there really won't be any price to pay. And I think what we've tried to show in Florida is, you know what, if you're virtue signaling, if you're smearing my people, my citizens, my legislature uh, for policies that we have, um, we're fighting back. Um, in the case of, of BDS, we were very clear on those policies uh, in Florida. And uh, even though we're a big market for them, we, uh, we acted very quickly. Um, we also have done it with, with other issues. I mean, you know, this stuff with the women's sports, we're protecting women's sports in Florida. The NCAA had been threatening that if you, if you uh, protect women's sports um, and you don't allow a biological male to participate um, in like girls track, like eighth grade track, 10th grade track, that they would not do events in that state. And so our legislature passed it. I announced, you know, when it gets to my desk, I'll definitely sign it. Um, and you know what? The NCAA then said, eh, you know, we'll still hold events in these places, okay? Because I think if you, sh if you show people you're willing to stand on principle, um, if you're willing to stand for the right things, if you show some backbone, um, that's a rare commodity nowadays, but I think it really, really matters. And so that's what we've done. Um, you know, looking forward, uh, we, we may um, end up doing another uh, trade mission. Uh, we're going to see, obviously, last year because of, and, you know, Israel was really locked down. I tried to tell them, open up, open up. Uh, so hopefully they're beyond that now because um, I know that they've opened up. And I mean, they even shut down Ben Gurion Airport for a time. Uh, so once that's open, you know, we obviously can look to see uh, if there's ways that we can continue to further the relationship between Israel and Florida. But I do think that us going over there, and not just me, but we had a tremendous group of people that came with us. I mean, Mort being one of them, but we had academic leaders, business leaders. It was the largest state trade mission in the history of Florida. Uh, I think we really helped solidify Florida as a place where some of the innovators over there look, okay, where, where do we go in the United States? And I think Florida is, is one of the top places now. Uh, and I don't know that that may have been true four or five years ago. So, so we're proud of that. We think that there's a great relationship uh, that continues uh, to lie ahead. The final thing I'll just say is people will always say, yes, Florida's doing well, people are coming, but, you know, particularly if they're coming from New York and New Jersey, are they going to import their left-wing ideas to Florida and then vote like they were when they were there? And, um, and so I tell people that, you know, it's possible some do that. Uh, I was like, but, you, you know, we have a lot of Orthodox Jews that are moving down uh, to Florida. And I think that may have been the number one demographic that I got in my election in terms of the percentages. So I always tell people, I'm like, look, if they're coming from New York, New Jersey, I think it's a mix. I can't tell you. Um, but if you show me an Orthodox uh, Jewish family, not only do I know they're, they're probably 90% going to be with us, a lot of them have big families. They're going to raise their kids on traditional values. So in 20 years, there's going to be a massive red wave uh, throughout the state of Florida. So we think that the migration's good. We absolutely think that uh, as strong as we've been in Florida standing uh, with Israel, I think you're bringing people that, that are just as strong 
um, and that are that are making it even um, even better. And so I know many of you probably down in South Florida either probably have places or visit places or been there. Um, so we our goal in the election, we got a number of different goals that we'll have in my reelection, you know, but one of them, you know, we want to turn out every Orthodox Jewish voter in the state of Florida, and we want to turn out every Israeli American voter who's in Florida or can vote absentee uh, from Israel. Because I think someone told me that the only group I did better with than Orthodox Jews in my election was Israeli Americans. I got like 90 some percent um, of Israeli Americans. And so uh, that I think is, a, is a, shows that, that Florida's doing well, uh, but a dynamic state where the political landscape can shift quickly. Um, it seems like um, it's shifting in, in a favorable direction. So I think you're gonna continue to see a lot of great stuff out of our state. Thank you so much, Governor DeSantis. Thank you so much for spending this time with, with ZOA and for your unwavering support for Israel. Governor, if you're able to spend uh, a couple minutes to answer two, one or two questions from our donors, that would be so wonderful. I have time for two quick questions. Okay, fantastic. So this is from longtime ZOA national board members here in Florida, Turner Moskowitz and Lori Moskowitz Hirsch. So Governor DeSantis, it's concerning Holocaust education. So there's a, a Department of Education Task Force, and it's been trying to, we're concerned about how it is trying to universalize Holocaust education, Holocaust education, and include things like critical race theory, uh, which is a real in, insult to Holocaust survivors. And it's uh, an issue that, that we wrote a, a petition, we got a lot of students and parents um, signatures on um, for this ZOA, ZOA letter. Will you be able to reject these recommendations and make sure that the education is does not does not get diluted and manipulated the memory and does not dilute the, the memory of the Holocaust. Well we absolutely reject critical race theory in Florida and uh, we are going to be doing more on this with the, our the Board of Education is meeting um, but we are not going to be allowing tax dollars to go uh, to uh, a pernicious ideology that really teaches people to hate their country, uh, to hate each other, and even hate themselves if they're a certain uh, uh, race. Um, and so it's, it's really toxic. It is particularly toxic, though, I, I think, um, you know, for, um, uh, for Holocaust education, for Jews in general, because I think coming out of, of those ideologies is spewing a lot of anti-Semitism that we're seeing um, in our country. And, you know, the media, you know, they've really not covered a lot of the incidents we're seeing, uh, national media at least, um, until very, very recently. They, they act like it's, um, you know, if there's one police officer that gets in any altercation with somebody of another, the police officer's white, it's not, they will make it sound, even if, they're, even if the officer was 100% right, they will, they will try to generate a narrative out of it. But if you have Jews being targeted, it's almost like that's not something that a lot of these people care about. So I think the ideology is very dangerous. I think it helps fuel uh, some of the hostilities uh, that we see um, against Jews, which, you know, like, I mean, I think we were, I mean, better off 15 years ago in terms of overall race relations, but certainly um, I think anti-Semitism has increased. Um, particularly in places like New York City and some of these other other areas, and so it's really really concerning. Uh, but you know you shouldn't water down Holocaust education. Uh, you shouldn't be trying to uh, draw equivalence between other historical events that are just simply not um, at the same magnitude um, as the Holocaust. And so uh, we will absolutely uh, hold the line on that. I'll tell you though the number of different influences that get tried to get smuggled into these things. I mean, even when you do it, you do the textbooks and then these textbooks will try to smuggle in different stuff. So, so it's a big battle, but I think it's a battle that's really important to fight. One of the reasons our country is so divided right now is because of the failures of some of the educational system uh, over the last couple of decades and particularly some of these very, very ideological and partisan universities. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to come down to the curriculum, making sure we've got the right curriculum and there's nothing bad in it and that it gets to as many students and it's used in as many schools as possible. So 
So for one more question, this is from national board member uh, also here in Florida, Dr. Paul Tartell. And he says, the ZOA has already directly experienced, and you touched on this during your, your presentation, big tech platform discrimination with regards to freedom of speech via this via, 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 via posting a video critical of the JCPOA. This not only affects our ability to get our word out for ZOA, but it also, also adversely affects our ability to fundraise. So as a national organization that also operates in Florida, what are our options to redress this under Florida law? So we just, I just signed a big tech a bill to um, provide protections for Floridians against big tech censorship and deplatforming. Uh, we've already been sued on it and obviously they're gonna sue any way that they can. You know, but basically, you know, here's what big tech does. So they have this protection under federal law, section 230, which basically says they can't be held liable for what's on their platforms because they're just providing a platform. They're not publishers. So if, if I post on Facebook and I, and I libel you, you may be able to sue me, but you're not gonna be able to sue Facebook. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the protection that they've utilized to really grow into these big behemoths that control huge percentage uh, of not just online speech, but all political speech um, now in this country. What we said is, okay, you say you're not a publisher, um, you know, you have this protection, you know, that really is more akin to a, a common carrier situation. And Clarence Thomas laid this out in a, in a concurrence um, a couple months ago. And so we did a bill to basically track what Justice Thomas was saying, but basically, if you have these privileges and you're acting more as a common carrier, uh, then there can be protections given to people um, against being discriminated against on viewpoint or the content of their speech. I mean, for example, um, you know, just imagine like your phone company, you sign up for phone service. Imagine if they denied service to people that supported Israel or something. Like you, you can't just get a new phone company. I mean, like they control so much of the market. So just like these big tech, they control so much of the market. They're basically monopolies. And so they're using their monopoly power in ways to stifle free expression, uh, to impose an orthodoxy on the country and to interfere in our elections. And so uh, we had the opening salvo following Justice Thomas's lead. And basically what it would say is, um, you market yourself as open platforms, you get protection under federal law and saying you're not publishers, yet you will suppress pro-Israel speech, but yet you'll allow pro-anti-Israel speech or anti-Semitic speech. Uh, so you don't have, uh, you're not applying these terms of service in a way uh, that, that are non-discriminatory. And so if you're deplatformed or censored, you can sue big tech for unfair and deceptive trade practices. And so that's kind of our ability to do that. You can do it as a private individual. You can also have the Attorney General of Florida uh, go after big tech um, and do this. But just think about what they've done. They said last year, if you would have said that COVID uh, leaked from a lab, they would censor you and to platform you for it. Corporate media like CNN said it was a conspiracy theory. So Facebook and Google and all that would suppress it. Now, even Fauci acknowledges that this is a live possibility. And the evidence, I think, every day is that, you know, it likely escaped from the lab. Um, if you had criticized coronavirus lockdowns last March or April, you would get your articles taken down. They would censor it. They would, they would do that. I even had one of my videos taken down a couple months ago. I had, re I had doctors from Harvard, Stanford, Oxford talking about these kids wearing masks. They said there's no basis to mask them. The evidence doesn't, if they would have been confronted with it's going to be litigated. We knew, we knew, that, we knew that from the beginning. Um, it will probably end up in the U.S. Supreme Court. But you know what? I think we've got a good chance uh, to win and prevail. And treat these companies like the monopolies that they are, uh, make sure that they don't have the ability to control our freedom of expression. And ultimately, we're making a stand against censorship and in favor of more speech. Governor DeSantis, I can't thank you enough. 
Um, Mort, I just wanted to turn it over to you for any last <laughs> comments before I close before I close it out. Well, uh, Governor, thank you so much. We've learned so much. We were inspired by you today, as we always are. Uh, you and I in ZOA have so much in common philosophically, politically, Zionistically. Uh, you might not know, by the way, that you and I also have a lot in common of our love of baseball. And I'm proud to say that I was all city third baseman in Philadelphia and hit for power. Oh, this good. was my first love. And if it wasn't for the fact that the, most of the games were on the Sabbath, I would have played in high school and uh, no question become a center fielder for the Philadelphia Phillies. But uh, <laughs> we love the extraordinary things that you've done for the state of Florida. We look forward uh, in the future, you having uh, another podium where you can do extraordinary things for the entire country. Thank you so much for honoring us and being with us and inspiring us today, Governor DeSantis. Thank you. Thanks guys, God bless. I thank you so much again, Governor DeSantis for being so gracious with your time and thank you all, our Donor Society members, so much for joining us. Please continue to follow ZOA's activities and events via email, in the media, and on social media. You can contact me, Florida, at zoa.org for more info on where you can find ZOA on social media or about anything else. And thank you all again for being here. I wish everyone a meaningful Memorial Weekend for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our country and Shabbat Shalom. That concludes today's program.